having fun? Yes. All right. You know, because some people don't think that education, you can have fun and become educated. And certainly, everyone in the room here, Sharona knows that that isn't true. Patterson knows that's not true. And all the sponsors in this, in this exhibit hall understand that we can have fun. And hopefully today you've had fun. Hopefully the speakers, the presenters have engaged you. They've motivated you. You've seen innovations. All right? You've seen, you've seen the research side of things. All right? So you've seen Dr. Rella Christensen, beautiful job sharing with us the research side of things. You've seen some clinical aspects also. And really, isn't that what evidence-based dentistry is? Isn't that really what evidence-based dentistry is? I'm a, I'm a full-time private practitioner, as you saw in Beverly Hills, California. All right? I do practice four days a week, so I am a, a wet-fingered dentist, just like pretty much everyone in this office. So I do teach at UCLA part-time, kind of in my spare time, and travel you know, the country and maybe even the globe, lecturing, sharing information, really, with, co <coughs> excuse me, with colleagues. Uh, here's Los Angeles, where I do practice. It is in, I am in Beverly Hills, and that conjures up you know, some kind of crazy ideas also. Uh, but, but I do really have a really down-home kind of practice. My wife, who's actually up here, she practices with me. Uh, my contact information is down here at the bottom. And so uh, more, you're more than happy if you're in town. Give me a call. Look me up. Come on in. We, we can share some stories. Um, I plan on sharing some stories with you today, really clinical stories. I'm going to show you some literature because I think the literature is very, very important for us to really understand and appreciate and apply, all right? But my main emphasis today is really to share with you really the possibilities, some preparation, some practicality of CIRAC, which you really, uh, you know, we're all evolving and learning. Now, you saw the car there. That's actually my wife's car. This is my car. Not really, <laughs> okay? That's not my wife's car either. But I do have a beautiful wife, two beautiful kids, all right? And if you live in Los Angeles and you have to put your kids through private school, which is really kind of the best way to go in Los Angeles, you know, you know that uh, having a dream car like that or cars like that really isn't going to be possible. So, uh, so that's just kind of a dream right now for me. But that's a beautiful, two beautiful cars. Uh, I just kind of had a little fun with that. There's my beautiful family, though, uh, really that inspires me. You know, we look at, we're looking at, we're talking about technology. We're talking about technology. And so, really, how do we define technology, right? This amazing, really new technology, this Omnicam that we just, it was just shared with us. I just heard about it on Monday, so it's not like I knew any more than anyone else, pretty much, in the room, to be honest with you. You know, the sum of practical knowledge is, is a nice way of putting it. This is one of my favorite definitions, though, of technology, okay? It is the knack of so arranging the world that we don't have to experience it. Kind of interesting thought, huh? Kind of interesting thought. Uh, so uh, that's a kind of interesting way to think about it. I want to walk us through just a little bit of technology, all right? Just to maybe have some thoughts. What do you think this is? What are we looking at here? There you go. Phonograph. So you're kind of looking at the history of music. You're looking at the history of music, all right? And if you look here, and then, you know, so that was a, you know, turnstile of some type, you know, how many people remember having to change a record, you know, flipping it over, listening to the other side of a record? I mean, that was crazy. That was crazy, right? And now we have nano pads, you know, got a thousand songs on it. And you could, you know, you can man manually work this in the dark, in the dark. I mean, you don't need to see this, all right? How about this? Well, this is pretty obvious, the history of the typewriter. How has technology evolved? How has technology changed the art form? Or how has the art form changed technology? How do you want to think about it? So the typewriters, we'd all probably say, is pretty dead today, isn't it? Who has a typewriter? Who has a typewriter today? Well, you all do, actually, don't you? You got a computer. You also have a cell phone, don't you? I mean, that's basically a typewriter. You got a keypad on your cell phone. Well, I just had to throw this one in because we're in Vegas, so I had to show slot machines. All right, so that's, that's pretty obvious. That's a slot machine. Those haven't developed much. Those really haven't changed a lot. So we have slot machines here. How about this one, though? This is an interesting one. We're looking at technology, how technology has evolved, how it's changed our lives, how it's changed our lives. This is actually one of the original slide projectors, all right? One of the original slide projectors. Who's got slide projectors today? Who uses slides today? All right? So we know that that's evolved. It's kind of, it's almost dead, isn't it? Slide projectors are pretty much dead. It's hard to even find bulbs almost for slide projectors today. But really, it's evolved. The art form has changed technology. So now we're using these big, beautiful projectors and they're, and they're putting the images together. Or you're using your TVs. You're looking at slideshows on your TVs today. Uh, just hooking up your cameras to TVs to get the direct feed. And this, 
How many people own one of these? All right. It's crazy. Crazy. Cell phones. Cell phones. Really crazy. And today, you know, I, I, I love the, the smart, you know, you got smart phones, we got smart keys, we got smart cars, we've got smart water. I think we've got a lot of smart people at Serona. Maybe it'd be nice if the world was filled with more smart people. What do you think? <laughs> All right. But, and, a, and certainly the last one here, sort of in my introduction really, is the CAD CAM, CAD CAM 1. How has this evolved so beautifully for us to really let us integrate this innovative technology into our practices? And CAD CAM 2, or CIRAC 2, I really should say, right? CIRAC 2, that's not, that's a better way of saying it. And then certainly the 3, 3D and such. And now the 4.0 software, which you all know, it makes it so much easier. This buckle bite, I just found the buckle bite. Gosh, you had the occlusion. The occlusion was so dead on with the buckle bite today. It's really fabulous. Um, you know, I use my machine, which I'm sure everyone here does every day. I mean, if that machine isn't cranking out something, I'm disappointed. That machine has to be cutting a block of some type every day in private practice. So again, my, my sort of charge was to talk a little bit about practicality preparation, all right, and possibilities, possibilities. I want to spend quite a bit of the majority of the time on some possibilities of this technology. But let's look at preparation because preparation is so important. Preparation is so important. Sam started talking about it this morning, all right, and are you prepared? Is there a softening approach to dissonance, inconsistency? So you're looking for predictability is really what we're looking for when we think about getting prepared for something, all right? And just something to maybe think about. I don't know if you've looked at the literature recently, but how clean, how clean does a restoration need to be? And when I went to dental school, you know, you had to be able to take a jackhammer in there, right? And, and you better not get a stick. You better not get any tug back. Right? And I think that evidence is really changing, and the mindset is changing. So if we look here at just a little bit of literature, and I know you can't read all of that, but I'll point out this red one. There is substantial evidence that the removal of all infected dentin and deep carious lesions is not required for successful carious treatment. Right? Now, the caveat to that, though, is provided that the restoration can seal the lesion from the oral environment effectively. I've done adhesive dentistry since 1987. Right? So uh, I stopped doing amalgams in 1987, so I have a 25-year history of doing adhesive dentistry. I firmly believe in the adhesive dentistry. I have my own beliefs. I, I believe you need to use a rubber dam personally. That's my own hang-up, right? and I know that's not what everyone's going to take away, and that's, that's okay, but isolation is very important. So let's look at preparations. Let's put, look at preparations from a fundamental standpoint. Well, well okay, in a fundamental standpoint, in a minimally invasive area, era in the minimally invasive area. Do we need to cut everything down for a crown? What does the literature say about that? And really a great article by uh, Edelhoff and Sorensen, all right, so a European colleague and American colleague, John Sorensen at Oregon, really talked about the findings of this in vitro study must be considered for sound clinical tooth preparation design criteria. And what did they come up with? I love this study. I love this study. It was done by weight, so it's not truly, you know, it's not a perfect analogy. It's not perfect, but it's a reasonable system to work from. Inlay onlays only prepare the tooth 5.5% to 35.5. So I usually think about it as 5.5 is just a little slot prep. You probably would do that direct, but you could be looking at 20 to 35%. Tooth removal is really what we're talking about here versus a crown. Have you ever seen these numbers before? 65, 75% of the tooth removed for a crown. Right? So I think the CIRAC system was built for inlays and onlays. It's built for crowns, obviously, also. Right? I'm not, not arguing that, of course, but it's a fabulous system for inlays and onlays. Conservative dentistry, minimally invasive dentistry, which is really a catch term today. The question is, do we all apply it? That's really the question. And so if you look here, you know, use of innovative preparation designs just remove the decay. Just makes everything smooth and flowing, which we'll see here in just a second, can result in conservation of sound to structure. And that's really what our patients want us to do. They want us to preserve their tooth structure. And if you were a patient sitting in my chair, you'd want the same thing of me also. Would you really want me to buzz your tooth down for a crown? I don't think there's a person in this room that wants me to do that. All right? And so I've spent 25 years really doing conservative dentistry. Inlay onlays for my whole career. I believe in minimally invasive dentistry. It's, it's just part of my core. And if you look at, let's just look at a design here. 
If you look at a design here, an inlay prep, on, uh, that's not really an onlay prep. If you look at an onlay prep, oh, I went a little bit too fast there. Let me go back there, sorry. So an onlay prep you can see versus a crown. You can see how much two structures removed. It's got to be at least twice as much, correct? At least twice as much going from here to here. So, I just started to say, fundamentally, what's a fundamental all ceramic restoration look like? And this is a review for many of you, I know that, but we need to all get on the same page. So what's fundamentally do we look for in an all ceramic, all ceramic restoration? And certainly, one of the first things really is watching with the, your divergent walls, 11 to 15 degrees. Some people say six to nine. I think that's a little bit tight, personally, so I would encourage 11 to 15, but that doesn't mean when I say 11 to 15, that you can go 20 to 30. You can, but you'd be removing sound two structures, so you wouldn't want to do that, all right? And everything rounded, rounded internal line angles. We all know that. Crack propagation in ceramics classically starts from the inside, so we need to protect the internal surfaces, but we need everything to be smooth and rounded. I call it a roller coaster, a roller coaster. So there's no sharp bends in a roller coaster. Everything is smooth and flowing. And as you go around a curve in the roller coaster, it's still smooth and flowing. So when you go into transition line angles, you have to do the same thing. Everything needs to be smooth and flowing. And then the isthmus width, one and a half to two millimeters, very common principles we're all very familiar with. And then the occlusal reduction of one and a half to two millimeters, but where do you measure that from? And there's where I think a lot of us get in trouble, is we tend to measure it from the buccal wall, the lingual wall, and you really need to measure it from your central fossa area. Where is this restoration going to be carved in? What kind of anatomy is the CIRAC system going to carve in it? And or are you going to go back and carve some more? So you need to have that thickness there. Again, fundamental principles and then trying to keep, trying to keep the contact, trying to keep your contact away from your centric stops, away from the margin, right? Away from the margins, really. So those, those are your basic fundamental principles. And if we look here, if we look here, Sam actually talked about it this morning also. He covered this, is, yeah, the camera can, can scan this. It can pick that up. It can design it. The milling unit can mill it. But the question is, will this fit? And so there's your milled restoration. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to bind. You're not going to get this down. So you obviously need to have a path of draw for these restorations also, which really goes back to that 11 to 16 degree kind of taper there is really what I would recommend for you. Let's look at this a little bit more uh, in depth here because we're talking about now a milled restoration, not a fundamentally all ceramic restoration. We're looking at a milled restoration. This little dot here, that's really the diameter of a one millimeter burr the milling burr in the CIRAC system. So what is this one millimeter diameter burr? How is that going to carry across the occlusal surface as it runs down? Just a little simple illustration here. How does that get covered there? Okay. So, you know, you might need to carve in a little more anatomy if that's what you like to do, if that's what you like to do. And watch internally though, watch internally right here. Is that going to be an issue as it came across this little edge here? And is it going to be an issue here? All right, and this, obviously this is just a simple illustration, a two-dimensional model. It's not exactly how the unit cuts, and so this would hold this restoration up versus watch how this, in a smooth and flowing preparation, everything is smooth and flowing, how this one millimeter diameter CIRAC burr would be able to handle it. And so sometimes clinicians, you'll hear it, that you know, CIRAC restorations don't fit. Well, I would disagree with that very strongly. They do fit, they fit very well, but you have to give the machine good information. It has to be a good scan. You know, it's sort of like that phrase, junk in, junk out, right? Junk in, junk out. So this restoration could get bound, binded here if you prepped it this way or here. How do you do that? How do you make these margins smooth and flowing? Certainly, I like electric hand pieces. I happen to use Brashler's NSK hand pieces, but hey, Cavo, you use the product you like on slow speed, fine diamond, and just run it around your margins. Right? And you can examine your margins with the scan, which is very nice. So let's look at a couple just kind of ideal preps with these principles in mind. Does everything look like it's smooth and flowing here? Looks like we're doing okay. And then look at this. So there's some issues. I believe everyone can see the issues here. 
So we went and maybe we we're just chasing a little bit of decay here, or we left this a little bit too sharp. That's not going to mill, and that's going to bind when you try to seat these restorations. So everything does need to be smooth and flowing, accommodating for that one millimeter milling burr in the CIRAC, you know, uh, unit, milling unit. And another prep design. Does this look like this is smooth and flowing? Does this look like it's smooth and flowing? Yes, that does. That's a very acceptable prep. But how about if we look at this? Again, you can see maybe we chased decay down the central fossa. So we started chasing decay down the central fossa, but we didn't accommodate for that milling burr. You know, so, so would this maybe work, just to be honest with you, would this maybe work in the press world? And it might. So it may be an acceptable prep in the press world, but we're really talking about the mill world. So we need to keep thinking about that one millimeter diameter burr. Very, very crucial. And I think I have one more prep design here. Look here, maybe a DOL, a DOL on an upper molar. And that looks like it's smooth and flowing. And here, oops, well, sorry. Oh, let me go back there real quick. I can go back there real quick. Very good. So here again, you might be chasing decay here, but really you got an isthmus problem here. Got an isthmus problem here. So we need that one and a half, two millimeter isthmus, so keep that in mind. Let's just look at just a couple CRAC cases. So everything that I'm going to be showing you are my cases that I've done clinically. Chair side, no extra time. I don't have time to do that. I run a very busy practice, all right? So this is really kind of the routine, really the routine. What we're really all trying to do is routine excellence in our dental practices. That's what I think we're all trying to do. And as educators, this is what we're trying to share with our audiences. So if we just look here, a case, we've got a DO, DOBL, maybe we'll call it that, and occlusal. All right, so occlusal, I love bonding. You're gonna see in possibilities how I like to bond. I do a lot of bonding. I know a lot of people think, because I'm in Beverly Hills, I probably you know, do veneers, 20 veneers on every patient that walks in my practice. That's so far from the truth, that's not the kind of dentistry that I like to do. Minimally invasive, all right, so you can see the preps have been cleaned out. You'll see rubber dams on all these cases. That's just the environment I like to work in, all right? Now, I'd like it not to be so bloody. I'd like it to be a little more clean than that, to be honest with you. But you can see we put a little dentin shade down there, okay? Put a little bit of tint down there. This is just me being fun, being an artist. I mean, isn't that what a lot of us went to dental school? Because we consider ourselves artists. And we put a little enamel shade over that and to carve in a little bit of anatomy here. Okay, very simple routine procedure there. And then if we watch, we're going to do this. So that was a direct here. And we'll do a CIRAC here. And we'll watch. the finished result here. And you can see, very nice margins, blends in very, very well here, the time of, you know the teeth get drier, right? I call the tooth, the tooth is like a turkey bone. It kind of dries out like a turkey bone, and as it rehydrates, it will moisten and slightly darken. And so you really want the restoration to be slightly darker than the tooth when you deliver it, um, if you're worried about uh, aesthetics here. But you're not really worried about that on a, on a lower first molar. Less, so here we got the before. You can see obviously the decay here and a broken down restoration here. And you'll watch that these pitted areas here are real important to either include in your prep or at least fill. All right? Those are real important. Most of the time I fill those with composite. I don't include them. You know, we don't need extension for prevention. The old principles of J.V. Black, I kind of tease and say, you know, with great respect, he died over 100 years ago. And those principles aren't that important as, to, as they were in those days. All right? So I think that's a nice result. We'd all be happy with that result. And we look at just a couple more cases here. Some OBs here, clean out the amalgams, clean up the preps. Again, I don't include this. I don't want to remove this much tooth structure. These little wear settings are probably their erosive lesions. It's really probably not a wear facet. It's probably a combination of some erosion, some acid potentially, uh, and then certainly some attrition. So it's probably a combination of attrition and erosion to have these kind of lesions. And we can go ahead and look at, watch it smooth and flowing, the preparation on both these teeth. Nice and smooth and flowing, accommodating for that one millimeter uh, CIRAC milling burr. And then powder it. All right, so well, okay, the Omnicam. We don't need to pow powder it anymore, right? All right, so that's like this is, so I get to throw these slides out. Now, all, anything that has powder on it, right, we'll slow those out. Not really, not really, because it's going to be a while before we all integrate that. I'm looking forward to getting my Omnicam. I'll tell you that right now, though, you know. And then the transition here to the final restoration. You can see the marginal fit here. You know, you can't really see a cement line. If we look at it from just a big shot here, OBs, okay, OBs, not really complex anatomy in them. And there's the, there's the CIRAC design, beautiful design. And this is beautiful design. And the fit really as it transitions into the 
final restoration. I think you would all be happy with that type of restoration in your mouth or any of your patient's mouths. Again, you see the rubber dam, that's my preference. And then, and then wow, the occlusal stops. I mean, here's the, the, the lower right corner here are the occlusal stops. Too many, really. <laughs> we don't really need to have that many occlusal stops, do we? We really don't have, need to have that many. So actually, I eliminated a couple of them, the ones I didn't think were that favorable, and left it in a really nice scenario there. I think I have one more case here, uh, maybe a couple more. So if we look at this, you can see this is an implant, so ignore that. This is an implant in a prototype right now. We got a, starting to get a DOL. We got a little fracture there, so we're cleaning that up, powdering it. And look at the way everything is smooth and flowing. With a rubber dam on, everything stays really clean. It's nicely isolated, very easy to work in this environment. And then the final restoration over here, integrated very nicely, returning the tooth to proper form and really function for us. All right, so there we have a large picture. Again, you can see the images taken right off screen saver. And there's the after. Again, look at the occlusal stops we have here. Now, I'm not standing, I wouldn't want to stand up here and say that every case I get occlusal stops like this, because that wouldn't be true either. All right? But certainly we do see it happen. We see it happen more often today with the buckle bite, I think, than the, other, than the older systems, for those that aren't familiar with that. But uh, certainly you can get this kind of occlusion in many of your cases. How about this preparation? <laughs> All right, look at this preparation. Look at the rubber dam isolation. So we got it well isolated. You know, would most of you save this distal marginal ridge? And I know the answer is probably, probably not. And you're probably thinking, why the heck does he do that? <laughs> and I guess the answer is because I can. I like tooth structure, okay? There's nothing better than enamel. We don't have a porcelain that's better than enamel. Rella started, you know, there's advantage and disadvantage of all the ceramic systems, all right, that we have out there. And so I like to save tooth structure. And you can see that with the enamel periphery, with the enamel periphery, this will be a fabulous restoration, and look how then this restoration gets integrated. It's a great starting point for the machine also. They have the distal marginal ridge, and so you get really a little bit nicer designs when you have some guidance from the tooth structure also. So I think a well-integrated uh, restoration. I know some people are going, wow, that's just crazy, but I love to save tooth structure at all costs. That's what I've done my whole career. Right? And look at this one. Now, you, now, you, now I'm really getting a little crazy. I'm going to do two restorations on tooth number 30. So I have an MO box. You can see the residual powder here. We obviously have to clean that out. But an MO box and a DOB. All right? And so in, this, in the middle illustration here, I've already delivered the two of them. And then I'm delivering 31 here. So 31 is an MOD. So we have an MOD here on 31. And Look at the x-ray. You know, some people say CRX don't have good margins. Sure they do. You know, sure they do. Very, very, very nice margins. Excellent, really, margins. It's really, do you know how to cut the preparation correctly and you get a good scan on these really is what's going to help you with this. This was actually, I did a, a Z100. So composite, this is what a composite looks on an x-ray, if you're not familiar with that. The Z100 composite blocks, this is what it looks like radiographically. Right? And these are, these actually, in those days, I was still doing Empress. This is a little bit older case, so this would actually be Empress. But I've got thousands of Empress restorations out there on second, uh, first and second molars, actually. Certainly my preference today, and I'm sure most of you would agree, would be to go to Emacs, especially on a second molar, and probably on most first molars also. The material shows tremendous amount of promise. But Rello certainly brought up some great cons you know, issues that we still need to address. We still really need to address. And so, and then you can see the final restoration. So let's look at just uh, fit here. Let's look at fit here. So look at this preparation. I'm saving the buckle cusp. I love to save two structures, so I'm saving the buckle cusp there. And you can see everything smooth and flowing. And you can see the integrated restoration in the lower right, black and white. Let's, let, let's do the try-in. That's actually Emacs tried in. Those are fabulous margins. Those are fabulous margins, right? And I know that you're experiencing these, these similar results in your practices. And again, the integration here, really quite nice. I think we'd all agree that's a nice restoration. If we look at two more cases of fit, this is the Lava Ultimate, the composite material. And I like to put tints in them. That's just fun for me. You don't have to do that. Right? But that's just fun for me. Carve in a little bit more anatomy, put some tints in. But look at this fit. Look at the fit. All right. 
Our European co colleague this morning talked about the fits. He showed us how these really do mill out quite accurately. And look at the integration here, returning the tooth to very nice form and function. And, and the last one from a fit concern, fit issue, here's an MO, M-O-B-L, you call it what you want. Here's the fit, there's the fit. No cement, obviously, just trying it in at this point, making sure it's accurate. And then you can see the lower integration there, all right? So, practicality, so that's, that covers preparation. Let's look at practicality. We all know how practical this is. I mean, it's, it, it's so efficient. You know, MTS has talked really all day about that, how efficient this, this system is, and it really is. The integration uh, is, uh, it's, it's, it really is amazing. Think about this. I've mentioned this uh, one other time when I did a CRAC meeting, which is a patient comes in, you numb the patient, you prep the teeth, your, your team members scan what you need scanned, the, the pre-op scans, I scan always the, the prep. My, my team members design, I have to approve the design, they go ahead and then we mill it, they actually, I carve a little bit more anatomy in because that just makes me feel better. They custom stain and glaze them, try them in, I come back and finish, uh, deliver these and finish these. But think about it also, is at some point if you magically then, you knew exactly what time it was, give them Oriverse, the local anesthetic reversing agent. So a patient comes in, unnumb, you get them numb to do the procedure to keep them comfortable, and then you give them the reversal agent, so they're leaving, and by the time they get back to their practice, their, or excuse me, their offices, they probably are unnumb. Isn't that a fabulous, really, practicality? I mean, it's fabulous for our patients. Something to think about, maybe integrate. Let me go through this a little bit quickly, because I'm a little behind. But certainly, we've talked a lot about innovation. It's meaningful only when the great ideas become real solutions to real issues, right? So really, just a nice way of describing innovation. So let's look at possibilities. Let's look at possibilities here. In the, really, in the minimal invasive world, what are some possibilities? Composite layered veneers. I don't know if you've heard this. I published a, 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 an article. I think I was the first one to come up with this concept, which is really cut back composite veneers. And I know some people are probably going, wow, that's a little over the top, Brian. I love doing bonding, but I like to keep it simple. And this really does simplify things for us, I think, quite nicely. We had layered empress veneers, right? We had layered empress veneers. Fabulous concept, still, uh, you know, I'm sure Hundreds of thousands of them are still done today. We're a layered empress veneer. And I said, well, if we can layer empress, I'm not a ceramist, and I don't really want to learn that skill. Right? I really don't want to learn. I can do simple stuff, but I don't really want to learn how to do uh, you know, high-end aesthetics, but I am very good with composite. I am very good with composite. So I said, how about applying those same principles? Let's do a composite layered veneer in the CIRAC world. The advantage is certainly, you know, it's, it's easier to do restorations outside the mouth, isn't it? And so most of these are fabricated completely outside the mouth. Higher aesthetics, uh, classically, you'll have good strength because you've got a good, strong core. got a good, strong core. Time and cost, probably going to save you on, on those, help you out there. More predictable, I think so. Disadvantages, there's always disadvantages. Take some technical skills, so it certainly does take some technical skills. Time and cost also. There's a learning curve to this. It's going to take you, you know, a couple cases to really learn this and pull this off and learn the sequencing. And then obviously you need to have a CIRAC system and you need to have the blocks, the appropriate blocks there. Limitations, as with any restoration, we need to have minimal thickness and minimal room. That's no new concept. That's, that's typical of any restoration. Any indications, though, if you're wondering, you know, okay, Brian, that sound, sounds like an interesting idea, but really, where are you going to apply this? And so it would be your cost-conscious patients, I think, really could uh, benefit from this. You can keep the cost down. We're doing these in composites right in the office. You know, you have your adolescents. Certainly, I'm, I'm not going to put a porcelain veneer classically on a 12, 13, 14-year-old who maybe comes out of ortho with peg laterals, and the parents are like, Brian, my, you know, my kid, he looks like he's got a got some silly tooth up there. I'm not, personally, I just, I'm just not going to do that. And so this works very well for adolescents. I'm going to show you a couple of patients. Emergency existing reconstruction cases you've done. I mean, how many times you've done a reconstruction, a patient is going along, all of a sudden you get that phone call, hey, I, I busted tooth number seven. All right? And you've got a busy schedule, so how do you work these in? So this can work very nicely there. Certainly for trial therapy, we'll end on showing you a case with trial therapy and medical limitations. Uh, uh, that can be a concern also. Patients that can't sit in the chair as long as we like them to. So can we either just scan them or can we take a quick model and work through the model work and get these restorations uh, handled? So we're really scanning, mock up, wax up, you, you do which one you want, scan again, and then the rest of it is the design and mill, as you're very familiar with. Then you can, you're going to cut these back. So you're going to mill it, you're going to cut these back, put some tints in, put some layers of composite in, and give it a nice high polish. 
and then you need to deliver these, so you need a, the cementation process, which everyone is familiar with, and then also getting the appropriate finish and polish for these restorations. Now, I came up with this little jig idea, so if you try this, you really want to kind of use this jig personally, I just find this to be a nice way to do this. So what is this jig? This is really just a stickum. You pick whatever company you like their stickums to, right? So you just want to be able to hold the veneer. And then the silicone material, the silicone material, the one that I like to use happens to be discus dental, uh, old discus dental, I guess. Uh, there, they have a, um, the rubber dam blockout, the rubber dam blockout material that they use. It's a nice silicone material. So I use that and I back flow that, if you will, a flowable composite. Here's your milled composite. So we're looking at possibilities in the CRAC world. We're looking at possibilities in the CRAC world. Here's your, here's your milled composite veneer, and you must put Vaseline on here, okay? So you got your milled composite veneer, put the stickum on there, and then put Vaseline in there. Otherwise, these may chip, they may break, and you may have some issues. So please, Vaseline is probably the most important thing I could tell you right here, is use your stickum, get it on there, put a little Vaseline around that, then your silicone, then, then your uh, composite, this was written on the on CRAC Doctors Forum. They called it the Lesage Technique. It was very nice of them to say that. Armin uh, put that out there on the forum. And uh, he's tried it, I think, uh, several times. And so here is, here is one. You can see I still have the sprue on it. So I'm attaching this with the sprue because I'm going to cut this all off. This now I can hold it. I can manipulate it. I can really easily handle this veneer. Trying to hold a little veneer with your fingers. I don't know how ceramics do that. So that's how I came up with this jig. Well, they make little jigs themselves also, many of them. And so you can see the silicone material in the middle silicone material in the middle, and then let's look how this plays out. Let's look at three or four cases, actually. Uh, this patient comes, and you can see she's got some issues. Everyone agree? She's not happy with her smile. She's not happy with her smile. So the aesthetic issues, really, we're looking at here is she's got severe crowding, crossbite on tooth number six. Look at six. It's in lingual version here, so it's in total crossbite, defective bonding on tooth number eight. All right, and we got rotated teeth, occlusal plane issues, and a little bit of midline issue. So we're going to put this patient quickly through. I'll go through these very quickly. We'll put them through Invisalign, what I call phase one. There's no way you're going to get to finalize this case in one treatment of, of Invisalign. So I tell the patient, you're going to have two phases to Invisalign. So we get her through here. Here's, here's pre-op. You see the crossbite still. There's phase one. Phase one, so we get her. We, get, we jump the arch. Right? I don't like that term, but we jump the arch. Everyone knows what I'm talking about there. But it's still not in a good position. You can still see there's some still occlusal issues. Don't like the midline. Don't like the occlusal planes here. So we go into phase two, a refinement is what Invisalign calls it. And how, here we have the final result. Now, she says, Brian, this canine is much bulkier and I like it versus this one. I'm like, wow, really? <laughs> Like, okay, I mean, I can see it, but it's like, who cares? I mean, you know, but you practice in Beverly Hills, sometimes you get some interesting requests. I'm sure you can imagine that. So I can't move the tooth because the tooth has perfect canine guidance. So it has immediate disclusion, which is very important to occlusion, as, as I'm sure everyone here knows. So I can't move the tooth. So th this was the first case I ever did one of these composite layered veneers on. This is the first case, right? Now we shot video. Uh, it's actually on the Horaeus website, if you, if you care. Uh, and we, so we shot video of this doing this live first time. Here's the final result. So there it is, there it is, doing, going through those steps, going through those steps, just like we talked, just, just the steps that we talked about earlier. And I'll show you the steps here in just a second. And there's the final restoration integrated, you know, trying to put a little bit of texture in it and making it match the existing dentition, all right? And so I think we've accomplished a pretty nice result. I did direct bonding on tooth number eight here. I like the bond. I really do like the bond. Minimally invasive. Here's the article if you want the references in dentistry today. It's the article I published was in dentistry today. October of 2001 was the article when that article was done. And I'm going to show you a couple other cases here. This, this case is an interesting case. I put veneers on this gentleman. All right, so he wanted veneers. He didn't want to go through ortho. Refused ortho. And there we have. And he's broken the tooth off at the gum line. So a case in this existing aesthetic case that you've done. Here's the original crown. So I have the original crown. Here's my milled coping. Just want to get something close. Doesn't even have to be that perfect, even though today we could get closer than this, because you have the crown, you can put it back in the mouth, just temporarily scan it with bio cop, biogenetic copy, and you can get a little closer to this. But no problem. We'll cut it back, put some dentin shades on it, maybe put some tints in it, maybe do an uh, enamel layer. And there's the final restoration. 
not to define a restoration, it's a composite. He needs to have, we need to, we need to super erupt this tooth, I need a ferrule effect. If I just try to put a crown on this tooth where this tooth is broken down, it isn't gonna work. So I need to buy some time for this gentleman. He doesn't have the funds. He says, Brian, I can't afford anything right now. You know, what can you do to buy me some time? I said, I got the great idea for you. A great idea, try this. So here's your original crown. Here's what I did in the Serac world, really with this composite layered veneer. So this is what we try to accomplish for the patient. I think you agree it's pretty close. Here it is in the patient's mouth. A little bit too much tint, a little bit too much tint. So I go ahead and polish it a little bit in the mouth, and there we go. And this is, the, this is really the day of. And this is almost two years later. He was actually he was just in this week. He's gone two, week, two years in this restoration, buying him some time, all right? So possibilities in the Syrac world. And un unbelievably so, this patient comes in. I didn't do these veneers, but I think they were pretty well done. She's got a little aesthetic issue here, and she ends up having the same problem. Breaks a tooth off at the gum line. Right? So again, put the tooth in, scan it. You got the tooth so you know exactly. Biocopy this, and then go ahead and here's, you can see the matrix, the jig to hold this, and then we're gonna cut it back. Cut it back, you can see I left room for some translucency. I didn't even like put some tints on the linguals. Why not? I just have fun, All right, it's just fun. Can this be done productively? Certainly it can, certainly it can. So the layering here, all right, so a little incisal translucency, a little bit of enamel, start cutting it back, get good contours. Here's the definitive restoration. You can see even the lingual, I like putting a little anatomy in, but why not in the facial? How's this blend with the patient's dentition? In this case, I did use a model, because sometimes on a crown, I will be honest with you, a crown, you'll, you'll get a little better fit. You'll be able to work out the interproximal context with a model. So, so on, on crowns, I classically will make a, a model for the patient. And so here, we're trying this in, and there's the, the restoration. Here's the definitive restoration. I think that's a nice result. Again, this patient needs that we need to super erupt this tooth. I need a good ferrule. As you all know, everyone knows you need a two, solid two millimeters of ferrule so we can pull this off. And so we sent it to the orthodontist, and very interestingly, you know, this is, this is a colleague, unfortunately, that really doesn't understand super eruption. You know, he destroyed my crown, which he didn't really need to do. He really needed to clear out the lingual, but that's a whole other discussion. But so it's like, I put all this effort into it, and then the guy cut the thing off. I was like, wow, dude, <laughs> you know, that wasn't very cool. <laughs> but that's okay, you know, that's okay. So, that was probably my fault, really. I didn't really tell him probably well what we did. I'll show you one other case, uh, and then we'll, kind of get to the, the last case here. Here's a case, this gentleman, I've bonded these edges at least three times in the last two years. This is getting frustrating for me, because that's not a lot of fun. So the question is, is I say, okay, well, hey man, can I do with this Herak? And will a, will a layered composite or a layered veneer be as strong as a milled veneer? And we all know the answer to that. Right? Porosities is the number one f reason why we, we see issues with restorations breaking, really. It's flaws in the porcelain and or composite, and both are going to be had when you hand sculpt these. So I said, okay, let's, let's, let me try Cerac. So I mock it up, mock it up, scan it. There's the prep, which is really no prep. Just took off the old composite that he had there. Took off the old composite here, scan that. All right, so there we are. There's the preps, which is, you can see there's no preps. Say, I like additive dentistry. I like additive dentistry. Let's not prep the teeth. There's no reason to prep these teeth. All right. And so here's the milled restorations. So these become a little tricky to, to hold sometimes. There's the milled restorations. And then here we are delivering them. And then delivering, you know, nine, then ten. All right. And there you can see the final restorations for this gentleman. And I can tell you, so there he was before. And there he is after with a well-integrated restoration, a layered composite veneer. Right? And these have been going, these are in, been in his mouth for about two years now, about two years, and holding up very nicely for him. He's thrilled. He's thrilled with this, that we, got a, we finally got him a, rest, a, a, a solution, really, to his, he ends up gritting his teeth. That's the problem. He stomps his teeth together like this, and, it, and that's really why he gets it. He's got a little dog. He says, when I get, see my dog, I get so excited, he says, and he throws his teeth together, which I, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> Uh, we're gonna have, can we, can we skip here, please? Can we skip the, there you go. So, 
I had a couple implant rest, uh, cases in here, but I really, unfortunately, because of time, I don't want to run us over. Obviously, you know, we're keeping, we want to keep the meeting running here and moving. So uh, I've done the same with implants, though. Uh, one case, I did a full mouth rehab on implants, and I made all single units. And with all the single units, I scanned it. And the gentleman actually, in, in the first six months to a year, broke one of the restorations. And because I had everything scanned, you know, I, before he got there, he goes, Brian, what are you going to do for me? And before he even got there, we had really milled already a restoration. He's like, dude, what are you going to do for me? I said, dude, here's what I'm going to do. Here's your restoration. Sit down, get in the chair, let me get that thing out, and let me put the new one in. It was just fabulous, fabulous what you can do with this technology. Let me wrap up with this case here. Let me wrap up with this case here. So this gal comes in. She has veneers done, all right? She's not happy with them at this point. She wants a smile makeover. She wants her smile enhanced. Let's not even say a smile makeover. You can see the relaxed lip position. You're going to lengthen these teeth. I don't think so. You might even want to consider shortening them, and that's really what we're working on here. So you can see her smile. She gets caught up on the lower lip a little bit. You can see the tremendous wear facetting, right? The attrition that exists on this lower dentition, tremendous. Tremendous. So probably, you know, she's you know kind of lost the vertical dimension, but certainly she certainly has uh, some wear issues here. And how are we going to address this? Now we saw this morning doing it chair side, and that's fabulous. Right? I'm not that talented. I'll just tell you that right now. Right? I want to do these outside of the mouth very easily. Now this case is only in prototypes. I believe I'm very I'm not very comfortable building these cases up the same day. People do it, and that's and that that works in your philosophy. Watch the overbite here. Okay, so really 100% overbite. So how are we going to open this bite up? And so we take models. So here's the model on our articulator, all right? And then we do a, I have a, really a master ceramist really wax this up for me. And then you can see we've opened the vertical dimension, the numbers on the articulator. And here's the original case, and here's the, you can see the, how much we've opened this vertical dimension. So we've done this outside the mouth. Very simple, very relaxed setting. So all we really did is took impressions, a face bow transfer, all right? And I tend to build these cases in centric relation. That happens to be the camp that I'm in, all right? So you decide what occlusal camp you want to fo follow there, but I like centric relation, centric, centric relation amount of study models with a face bow transfer, all right? All the really principles, I'll tell you, all the really principles of really my mentor, Dr. Frank Spear, who everyone knows here, really has, has had a great influence, tremendous influence on my really career uh, and my professional uh, growth and development. So these are all principles that really I learned uh, much from Frank and also from Peter Dawson uh, going back that long. And so here's the models. You can see the curve of speed issues. We're going to actually build this tooth out, and we'll get the curve of speed there correct. And you can see the lower teeth actually have super erupted. I don't even need to replace these lower teeth. The crowns here are fine. I need to replace the upper teeth is what this study is going to tell me. Here's the wax up close up. Here's the wax up close up. And we're going to scan it. All right, so we scan the wax up. We scan the models, the, the original models, the original dentition of the patient. In biogeneric copying, you copy it. All right, there's the copy. There's the copy of one of them, all right? So we'll, we'll do all of them. Just a couple views. So this is additive again. I'm adding, I'm not taking, I haven't touched these teeth at all. How simple is this? We've taken impressions. I do, I do final, I do PVS impressions. So I do final impressions, as I said, uh, Facebook transfer, centric relation study models, all right, and get it waxed up nicely. And then, I haven't touched these teeth at all. No reason to touch these teeth. I'm trialing, I'm testing out the new vertical dimension. That's really what I want to do here. And some of the other views here. So I'm going to mock up the lower teeth. So I'm going to do 21 through 28. She's missing second premolars, upper and lower, for by extractions ortho earlier in her life. And so I've, I've got 21 through 28, and I'm going to take this to the mouth now. Hopefully. Ah. Mill them just because I like cu cu cutting them back a little, customizing them a little bit, trying different translucencies for this patient. What's going to make this lady happy? She's a little bit particular, and good for her. She deserves to be particular, all right? And so we've put a little bit of tint in there. This is a lava ultimate material, which is a very pretty material, all right? So you don't absolutely have to do this. This is me having fun, really. That's what this is all about. This is usually a Saturday afternoon or something, uh, and, and uh, just spending a little bit of time doing this, and now we'll deliver them. Typical bonding stages, everyone knows how to do that. So your etch, prime, and bond, whatever system you're using. And we have these restorations now, the two centrals delivered. 
Check your vertical, see if you're kind of happy with those two stops. Generally, you will be. You did it on an articulator with a face boat transfer, center relation mounted models. This isn't really you know, that hard to do. It's not that challenging at this point. And I'm just delivering these restorations. So my, the chair time is really minimal. It's nothing almost, right? I took models of her. We did everything in the lab, and, and my assistants did most of this work, to be honest with you. I cut them back and put a little bit of, of tint and composite on there. It wasn't absolutely necessary. And then here she is with the lowers restored, and then I did the biogeneric in the mouth and made the rest of the posterior restorations to finish off the occlusal scheme as trial therapy. So these are composites as trial therapy. You can bond a composite to gold, you can bond it to porcelain, it doesn't matter. So this is all trial therapy. My philosophy is I like to let this patient run with this, if you will, trial it, function, live, See if they like it, you know, see if they scare the dog or something when they go home, all right? Check it out, but look at the vertical dimension, how much we've opened it here, and they go three months, six months, there's no rush, there's no rush. What's the rush? This patient isn't going anywhere. All right, and then here you can see, I've mocked up the upper hand, actually I did the uppers by hand just to kind of look at, you know, how man versus sort of machine, little kind of experiments that I do in my practice, and she had old veneers up there, I didn't cut them all the way off, so here's where she is. You can see her original dentition, Oh, sorry, we were over here. You can see her smile, how that's changed nicely. And then, and there she is now with all the posterior teeth in place also. Unfortunately, she doesn't think these are white enough. That's an interesting trial. All right, so, so she wants these actually whiter. I think it's a pretty nice shade, if not too white, for her already, but that's where she is. So, really, in this, in this very brief, you know, 45 minutes that I had with you, I have hoped that I've been able to kind of share with you you know, some, some of the practicalities, you know how efficient, really kind of almost easy, certainly easier, uh, the CIRAC makes our lives really. You can be productive with it, you can have fun with it, you know, you can, you can try all po kinds of possibilities. Preparation, certainly you need to modify your prep a little bit and think about Think outside the box. Think outside the box. How can you use this? It's just a sophisticated lab, if you will. Really, the CEREC is. It's a sophisticated lab, and you get to be the, the driver of that lab. You get to run the sophistication, all right? And there are really endless, endless possibilities with this machine. I haven't discovered them yet. In fact, please, at the reception, if you've got an idea of a possibility, please come up to me and tell me it's something that you're doing outside the box. I'd love to hear it, and I'll be happy to visit with anyone who wants to know other possibilities, all right? And the sky is the limit. The sky is the limit with this technology. All right, be creative, have fun. All right, thank you very much for allowing me to be part of this. This is, my, this is my office. And thank you, Sirona. Thank you, Patterson. Appreciate uh, all your attention.